Good morning. The Chicago Council is a very important partner for us, so I'm just thrilled to be part of the symposium today and really honored also to be on the speaker's platform with several of our U.S. government representatives, Secretary Vilsack, National Security Advisor Rice, Administrator Shaw. We are so grateful to you for the leadership that you're showing in putting food security and nutrition at the top of our development agenda and securing the funding to support those agendas. So thank you so very much for that. We are partners with a lot of you in this room on the agenda to reduce poverty reduction for developing country smallholder farmers. And yet, when we look at the IPC panel report, it concludes that climate change impacts are expected to exacerbate poverty. So this business as usual scenario of 2% yield reduction each decade for the next century will really slow down economic growth, it's going to further erode our food security, and it's going to create new poverty traps. Addressing climate change is really mission critical for our food security and our poverty alleviation agendas. The Agricultural Development Program of the Foundation has the strategic objectives of sustainable productivity growth, for 14 staple crops and four livestock commodities in 11 target geographies in Africa and South Asia. Our contribution to climate change is investing in the research to climate proof these staple crops. Any of you who follow The Economist would have seen an art, uh, article about a week ago on the new rice varieties that we affectionately call scuba rice. Um, these are varieties uh, where resistance was identified by the scientists at the International Rice Research Institute. It's resistant to the flooding. So the severe weather events that we get very frequently, especially in Asia, basically are now more tolerable. Farmers can have their uh, severe flooding submerge their rice for up to 10, to days, 10 days and still come away with a rice crop. And in fact, the new rice lines are even improved crop yields significantly improved. So instead of one ton per hectare, they're walking away with up to four and a half tons per hectare with these new lines. The work was originally funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and other CG donors. We then came in and incorporated, helped fund the incorporation of this resistance into farmer selected preferred varieties and helped with the scale up. So these varieties are now in the hands of five million farmers across South Asia. One of the important points of this story is that this work started in the early 1980s, 30 years to get from the lab to scale up. So in this intensifying climate change scenario, we don't have the luxury anymore for those kinds of timelines and time lags. We need to get faster and better at what we're doing. We're also investing with CIMIT to develop drought-tolerant maize for Africa. You can see the difference, the dramatic difference in these tolerant versus non-tolerant varieties. There are 140 of them out in 13 countries, over an estimated almost one and a quarter million hectares, and they're benefiting three million households. The other good news is that this is also being supplied by African seed companies. We're also working on a series of crops that have been traditionally underinvested. Cassava, sweet potato and yams, sorghum, bananas, pearl millet, rice millet. The point of this is that these crops are more naturally tolerant to severe weather events, particularly drought. So for example, farmers in Western Africa and the Sahel do have the option to move to the more drought tolerant maize or to diversify into higher productivity pearl millet and sorghum, which are naturally tolerant. So we're trying to increase productivity and give options for resilience to these farmers. Cynthia pointed out this morning, livestock are one of the contributors to climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and indeed FAO data from this year show that emission intensity is greatest in the developing world, particularly in Africa. But there's a range of intensities across different livestock commodities. The foundation is investing in dairy, small ruminants, which are goats and sheep, and poultry. 
We believe that increasing dairy productivity will not only contribute to income and nutrition, but also drive down the intensity of emissions. So we're really working on increasing productivity, climate proofing, contributing to the mitigation that was mentioned in the previous panel. But we believe very firmly as we go forward that this productivity growth as well as climate change need to be contextualized within a broader sustainability framework. And there are some very interesting frameworks that are beginning to emerge. For example, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. You can see that they're focusing on productivity growth, but within a much broader systems frame. So the team for ag work is attempting to redefine the boundaries of the system, pull in what we used to call externalities, incorporate them into the system, including climate change, understand the relationships between the components and attempt to cost them. We need to understand what are the costs of our food systems, the economic costs, the social costs, the environmental costs. So we would like to commend the Chicago Council for this wonderful report and really particularly underline recommendation one, which is to continue prioritizing food security and the suggestion, as Bill Riley said this morning, that we integrate the feed the future and the agricultural components of the climate change global work. We really believe that climate change needs to be built into these overall sustainable frameworks frameworks for uh, sustainability. I'm old enough to remember the 1990s when the natural resource management agenda emerged. And instead of supporting our agricultural research, it actually took on a life of its own. And it distracted from what we were attempting to do with agriculture and diverted a lot of our funding. So we can't really allow that to happen. We need to build climate change into these broader frameworks for resilience and sustainability. We are really optimistic. I mean, the science that we're seeing in the three reports that Cynthia mentioned this morning are really improving our understanding. We're starting to see the research bear fruits. But as our co-chairs are very fond of saying, we are impatient optimists. We really need to see the agricultural research investment protected and continue to increase, as was signaled this morning. We also want to see more novel, radical partnerships so that once we get those research innovations out to the field, we start to scale them up in nonlinear manners. I think one of the things that climate change science is teaching us, again, underlining again, is we don't have the luxury of time. This is an urgent agenda. So ladies and gentlemen, we stand ready at the Gates Foundation to continue partnering with you on climate change as a component, as a mission critical component of our food security and poverty reduction strategies. Thank you very much.